stream does not work. So, all right, let's look at computer vision. So here, this is a famous database of clothing items from some store where you have a whole bunch of little pictures of clothing in 10 categories, t-shirts, trousers, dresses, sneakers, and so on. And we're gonna train a model to recognize them. And it's gonna work like this. In will come a whole bunch of data for every pixel, 784 grayscale values. And then we'll have some hidden layers and 10 output layers that sort them into categories like this. Here's the input, all the pixels come in, hidden neurons do the work, combining all the data and then it outputs the probability that that's a coat or a sneaker or a bag or the other options. And that's the point of this is you don't write any code that looks for any features, you just train the model. This is called supervised learning. You have data and the data comes with the correct categorization. And so it practices until its weights of all those parameters are such that it has the maximum accuracy at correctly sorting them into the right category. So here's the uh, code that does it. This will download the data from an online resource. And uh, let me just make a new block here. I'll throw, move to trash to throw away my old stuff. Return to Colab. And uh, new notebook to get a clean notebook. Okay. And I'll say even whatever internet I'm getting, a little bit of internet is enough. Doesn't take much. Okay, and here's the code that does that. So this is gonna take the training images and sort of normalize them. Then it's going to have an input of 28 by 28. So that's an input for each pixel. Then one hidden layer with 128 neurons and then 10 output neurons. So really simple, just one layer of neural processing. And so I can start this thing. It's going to train it in five epochs because of course it's a much more complicated model. Does each neuron represent like one potential parameter that it can assign? Much or more than that. Each neuron, let's get, each neuron here has all the pixels feeding into it. So this neuron has like two parameters for every one of these lines coming in, and there's as many as, the, so each neuron has like 784 times two parameters. And then if there was another layer, it would have all the inputs in the previous layer. So it grows at like the square of the number of neurons. It inherits the parameters from the previous layer? No, it does not inherit parameters in the previous layer. It just inherits signal from the previous layer, and it reads its parameters are adjustable. So it's fitting, it's trying thousands of parameters, making a huge high dimensional space, and then using various algorithms to try to find a local minimum. And the normal one is gradient descent. So you guess a spot, and then you try to roll down like a ball rolling down a hill, and that means it can get stuck in a local minimum that's not really the best. That's one of the common flaws of machine learning. And this is also called simulated annealing. When you try, it also applies to protein folding and everything else. You're trying to find an optimum state of a complex system and you can get stuck in a local minimum so that small changes make it worse when in fact a big change would move you to a different region where there's a better solution. That's one of the many things that can go wrong with uh, machine learning. Anyway, there it goes. It downloaded the data. It did five training. And here's the accuracy. The accuracy is um, 87%. So it's 87% correct on the training data. In fact, I think we broke it into training and test data. Yeah, here we are. So usually what you do is you take about 80% of the data and use it to train. And then you take 20% of the data and test with that um, to see images it's never seen before that are still in the same category. And so there should be two numbers here. Yeah, so the original one, I guess I need to shrink the font. There, the 89% is how much it did on the test, the training data. So the training data, it was able to get 89% accurate. The test data, it's 87% accurate. So that makes sense. It learned, but when confronted with new images it's never seen before, it's somewhat worse. It is possible to overtrain your model so it precisely matches the training data, but now it's less effective on the test data because it sort of fits to the noise, which is not the best representation of the test data. And that's gonna come back later uh, when we get to uh, real data, housing data, and it applies to um, political polls, like trying to predict the next president. It's very easy to have data where you learn too much about this data and you're getting less information about the, what you really need. So let's have another block of code, and we're going to just print out the first 20. Since it only was 89% accurate, we should be able to spot some mistakes here. So here's the output of this thing, and what we're seeing here is the categories, zero through nine, the first number is the right answer, 
and the value in here is the weight. So the first one, the right answer is nine, and as you can see, it found a 94% chance that it was nine, and only a small percentage of anything else, so it got it right. Same thing for number two. If you look down here for one that's wrong, you wanna look for a number that's small, like here's 80 and 15. So this is, right answer is four, but it only got an 80% chance of being four, so it got it right, but it was being somewhat confused. Um, down here is 13 and 84, that's, uh, here's one, 64 and 29, okay, the right answer is 7, 9, 8, 7, it got it right. Um, we should be able to find ones it got wrong, but in this case, I may not, here's, that's right, I may not be able to find one it got wrong. Wait, here's 48, and 48, okay, this 6 it had a real problem with. I don't know if it got it right or wrong, but it had a 48% chance of being zero and a 48% chance of being six. So this one confused it. So that one, which is zero, one, two, three, four, five, I think. Zero, one, two, three, four. Number four, it really got wrong. So let's take a look at some of these images. Um, this will view a couple of images. Let's put in that code. Uh, code, not text. There we are. All right, and I want to do image number four instead of 11 because I think that's the one it got wrong. All right, so that's one it got right. That's one it got wrong. And I think the point is you can't tell if it's a t-shirt or a coat, something like that. Um, category zero, I think it was confused between categories zero and four, right? Zero, one, two, three, four, five, six. Zero and six. And zero and six are t-shirt and shirt. Well, yeah, I don't know if I, I have trouble making that distinction too. <laughs> so this is either a t-shirt or a shirt and it's having trouble making its mind, although there are sleeves there. I would make it a shirt. Anyway, so that's what's going on. It has these things and you can see it's getting confused like when you would. So um, you can train it for more and it will get better. But the, notice the, if you train it for 25 epochs, the accuracy for the training set goes up, but the accuracy on the test set hardly goes up at all. So the additional training is not really making it any better. And then um, you can have a flag you find here which shows how many parameters there are, but you can see it's about 100,000 parameters for that job. Now, there's some more image processing ones here, like breaking a captcha and deblurring images, and let me just talk about those because those are fun ones to try. I would like to open that. Oh, that's right. They changed the stupid browser, so I have to hold this down. Okay. Anyway, um, yeah, Opera updated everything. I wish they would just leave it alone. Anyway, so uh, if we download some CAPTCHAs. Here's a bunch of CAPTCHA images. This CAPTCHA just sort of tilts the letters over and uh, makes the font change, so it's a pretty dumb CAPTCHA, but we download some CAPTCHAs. Now you have to prepare the images by pre-processing them. And then you got a bunch of process. You can train a model to solve this CAPTCHA and um, get it down to where it's quite accurate, 92% accurate, accurate on the test data, on the training data, and 86% accurate on the test data. And you can find a summary model. So that's a simple case of a CAPTCHA. The next one is the one that really amazed me, de-blurring images. You see this in all the cop shows. They have this picture and they say, oh, run it through the computer. <laughs> Turns into a beautiful image. You can do that. I thought that was bullshit. So you get some, somebody made a database of blurry and sharp images for a whole bunch of cameras. They just defocused the cameras and published the blurry and sharp images. So you can download it, and here's an example of a sharp image and a blurry image. You got a bunch of these full color picture, color real camera pictures. Then you can make a data set of them, train your model, and um, you have to go through an encoding step. Now you've got, um, and you got a lot more parameters, like 17 million parameters to do this. You prepare an encoder and a decoder, and then you train your model. Now, if you train it, and you spend five minutes of training, the results are god-awful. Um, if you look here, um, it takes this. Now, you give these some blurry images it's never seen before. This is the blurry image. This is what you're hoping. That's what it produces. So training it for five minutes is not exactly a success. But if you train it for an hour and a half, it actually gets pretty good. It takes this blurry image and moves it a considerable distance towards that sharp image. And remember, it has never seen this image before. It has learned the general concept of deblurring an image. And I ought to mention, this is how the image generating things work, like uh, diffusion, uh, stable diffusion. Let me bring that up if you haven't seen it. Stable diffusion. 
oh, I got enough bandwidth to do stuff. So here's stable diffusion, and I should be able to, when it loads, okay. This is the image processor, so I can get started for free. That would suit me. Making my dreams come true, that would be swell. Um, uh, prompts, wait, I, don't, I wanna enter a prompt. I don't care about your prompt database. Stable Diffusion Playground, just enter your prompt and hit the generate button. All right, I think it's still loading the page. There should be a place somewhere. They care about my privacy. Ah, there we are. So my prompt is a cat riding a bicycle in the bicycle in the style of Picasso. There, that should do. All right. And there it goes, not taking long at all. And when it's able to download the images, there they are. There's cats riding a bicycle in the style of Picasso. And, but how this works is mind blowing. And I learned this from the Google machine learning training. It gets a bunch of Picasso images, like from the web. Then it, it train, it, takes those models and it adds noise to them to blur them into 1,000 progressively blurry images to create a fake machine learning generated data set. Then it trains de-blurring, just like the one I showed you. It learns how to de-blur things in the style of Picasso. Then each of these four images started as just random dots and it ran it through a thousand stages of de-blurring the randomness. That's how it works. Now, if you told me that, I would say, I'm not funding you guys. You guys are lunatics. That will never work. And if you get it working, it'll take so much CPU, it would never work. And I'm wrong, like I've been wrong about all this stuff. That's what it really does. And uh, anyway, by the way, that reminds me I should mention, you should get Google badges. This is Google learning in this. It is awesome. You watch these videos, you take a little quiz, you earn badges. I got six or eight of them. You can even put them in the scoreboard here if you like. You can, I made a scraper that will scrape your Google badge points and add it to the scoreboard. These things are great. Google badges, there's a pub, there's, there's a uh, like GUID looking thing that'll appear here. You put that in, it'll go to your profile and give you points for it. These things are great. If you go to the journey, um, if it loads, I can show you. Uh, I highly recommend this. This is where you learn what's really going on here. And I think the later ones have hands-on Python stuff you do in there, although the ones I did were just conceptual. But I learned a lot from the conceptual stuff. If so, you're yeah. generative like that, um, does that mean like you should, it might be statistically possible, but basically you will never get the same output from an image yes. requested from a prompt? Like yeah, that's right, it's random. You always get a different image. It's generated from just random noise. Now, if you write your own Python, you can use a, a random noise generator that uses a seed and you can control the seed so you could reproduce it later if you wanted to. This free one doesn't give you access to that. But if you do it yourself, which is the way to do it, I mean, these online things are out of your control and they keep changing them, and anything you send up to them is potentially exposed to the internet, so they're really only there as demos. What you really need is to have your own servers doing this, so you control everything. And then all you gotta do is write these Python things, which are not that hard at all, to do it. So anyway, that's the next bit I wanted to show you. Let me stop this video.